Thank you so much, Peter, and thanks to each one of you for coming out today. The topic that we're looking at is an exciting topic, more exciting than I thought it would be when I started preparing for this several months ago. The arrangements were made and the schedule was set for uh, this topic way back in the spring, and so I began to read and prepare my own heart at that point in time and began to pray about the subject that's before us today. And uh, I thought, you know, this will be a breeze uh, because you, uh, you find that there's a lot of information available on angels. No problem to find information. The problem today is finding good information <laughs> other than going to the scriptures. So I'm thankful for the privilege today of dealing with this subject. It's a privilege always to open God's word and to be able to uh, minister the word of God at any occasion and every occasion. But the subject before us today is really, I have found, has become overwhelming. As I began to study this subject, uh, I have since the 1st of September uh, averaged five hours a day uh, in study in preparation for today. Uh, I have been studying, as I say, since last spring in preparation for this. When I was in India this summer, I read every day. I read the entire New Testament just with the focus of looking to see what the New Testament said about angels. And so... Uh, as I say, I've got a lot more information today than I could ever dream about giving to you. In fact, normally in a message, I use uh, an outline that, uh, and my notes, a uh, maximum of three pages. I have 60 pages in my outline today to give to you. Now, if we just amplified that a little bit and had a book, we could just publish our first book here on angels and uh, just distribute it. But we don't have that type, kind of time. But uh, the subject really is overwhelming, as I found... Uh, uh, Every page almost you turn in the scriptures has something to say about angels, either good or evil. And so it is kind of a, a, uh, an overwhelming subject. I also today come approaching this subject a little bit uh, uh, with fear and trembling because a number of years ago I taught the subject of angels. And uh, when I taught the subject of angels, Arlene was present. Not really, this is a story, okay? Arlene was present and... Uh, uh, she came up to me, this dear, sweet lady that we know as Arlene, and you know how bashful and shy she is. So she timidly came up to me, and Arlene, when she came up, uh, she came up and said, uh, Jack, I really must correct you on what you've been teaching about angels. And I said, well, why is that, Arlene? And she said, well, well, really, because what you said about angels isn't true. And I said, well, exactly, Arlene, what I taught about angels is not true. And she said, well, you have taught that angels, there are no such thing as female angels in the Bible. And I disagree with that. In fact, the other facts that you taught us about the Bible, uh, about angels in the Bible, would tell us that angels definitely are female. And so, of course, I'm very puzzled then because I remembered that I'd taught that always when the word angel is used in the Bible, it's uh, the male uh, uh, form of the word is used and you go through and other information and so I said well Arlene it's, it's pretty obvious in the scriptures they are men no they're not three characteristics that you taught would make it very clear that they are not definitely not male they're female angels all right Arlene what are they well you said they're always up in the air nothing to wear and always harping about something Sorry, Arlene, but uh, I couldn't pass up this opportunity. <laughs> the, uh, today you have an outline before you, and the outline is, uh, covers the four sessions. I doubt that we will cover session number four. Uh, session number four is a very important session that needs to be dealt with, but we, I, I'm sure we'll not have time to get to that. But I do want to cover especially the information that I've outlined for you in the first three sessions, and perhaps in time the fourth session can be dealt with on another occasion. The, uh, the information that we have uh, before you, I've tried to leave some space for you to make some notes. The notes certainly, uh, you will not be able to take uh, thorough notes or complete notes, but enough perhaps to prompt your, your memory. So as we, we look at each uh, session, you'll find that in, in this first session, we want to look at very carefully the, the matter of a little bit of introduction, the reality and existence of angels, and then we want to deal a little bit of a, a survey of angels as it's been found through church history and as well in secular history. 
And it's amazing when you, when you begin to read how much has been said about angels in church history and in secular history. The, the, uh, there, there's much said about angels, more than I ever dreamed when I began to do this study for angels. In the second session, we want to deal more with the origin of angels, the number of angels, get into what some of the uh, important things that the Bible says about angels. And then the third session, and it'll probably move over before we get to this one, we'll be into the fourth session, we want to deal with the ministry of good angels. We could, as I say, deal with so many other things today. I do have a section in the notes on the angel of the Lord, which is a fascinating study that we don't have time to deal with. I'm not going to deal with guardian angels, which is a question that everybody has when you talk about angels. I don't have any uh, uh, probably uh, time to deal with a subject that I'd love to deal with you on, and that is angels being the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6 which I'm sure is a question that you all have, uh, or uh, an area that you all have questions about. So there are a lot of areas that we're going to have to probably no more than just mention in passing today because of the time element that's before us. But as far as uh, an introduction to angelology, a few weeks back I watched and listened with amazement, as probably many of you did, to TV uh, at the death of two ladies, uh, Princess Diana and the lady they call Mother Teresa. I have trouble saying Mother Teresa. I have personally just call her Teresa. Uh, I, I don't want to be disrespectful, but I just have problems. I have one mother, and she's a very godly lady, and I love her dearly, but, but uh, my mother is not Mother Teresa. My mother is Mother Carell. Pat is her name, Patience. And I cause her to live up to her name many times. <laughs> but anyhow, I watched in amazement at the death of Princess Diana, especially because I had just... Uh, coming back from India, I just, we had a, a stopover, a intentional in London, to spend about three and a half days in London. And, of course, we had been by uh, uh, Princess Diana and Fergie's uh, apartment, and we had uh, uh, really uh, did London as far as some of the uh, uh, sites and so on. I had been there before, so I knew where I wanted to go and a new place I wanted to see and visit. And so when I got back, I, I arrived back in, in the States on Friday afternoon, and Saturday evening, uh, we heard the news that she had been in the accident. Sunday morning before we went to meetings, we heard the news that she had, had died. And so uh, time we get back to Canada, it's time for her funeral. And so we watched, in a, in, as I say, in amazement, uh, the, the funeral service. And one great disappointment that I had was that there was no gospel whatsoever given in that entire funeral service if you listen to it. Nothing whatsoever. Uh, that would even hint to the gospel, and that was disappointing, especially since I'd just been in the abbey a, a few days before, and, and the gospel is plastered all over the abbey if you've been there in uh, text and everything else, but there was nothing at all giving the gospel. But the statement was made by one of the news broadcasters, said this, the world has lost two women of compassion. Heaven has gained two angels. That really communicates what the world's view of angels is. The idea, and it's been communicated for years, that when a person dies, and it's been popularized in TV shows and everything else, you sort of earn your wings. And when you die, you become an angel. You do not find that in the scriptures. And yet it does give to us a hint of the world's view of angels. Throughout history, there have been cycles of interest in angels. A survey recently done by a mag Time magazine stated the following fact. 69% of the people polled believe in the existence of angels. Now, I, when I read that statistic, I was sort of surprised because I figured it would be higher than that with what we see going on in the world today. And if you go into any bookstore, you, what you see in any secular bookstore, I really figured the figure would be higher. It also said, though, 46% of the people who were polled believed that they have a guardian angel. And the poll goes ahead and deals with other issues uh, that, that are very significant regarding angels that I'm not going to get into. Christianity Today, back in 1993, made this statement concerning angels, really, or the spirit world. It said the quest for spiritual meaning would be one of the greatest concerns of baby boomers in the 90s. And this quest for spiritual meaning really is coming out through uh, uh, angels and through uh, uh, ch uh, demons, uh, through evil spirits, channeling, and all of these other things that we hear about as far as 
angel, uh, angels today are concerned. For years, people scoffed at the ideas of angels. Christians throughout uh, uh, history have believed in angels, and yet for the most part have ignored angels. In fact, I can remember as a young man, sort of one of my first exposures to angels when I began to read missionary biographies. And you'd read these stories of missionaries from Africa and from South America and other places, and they would have stories about uh, angelic intervention in, in their uh, protection from uh, angels. And, and you'd read that, and being in North America and no experience in this, line, you'd almost say, this can't be real. And yet when you'd read the Scripture, you would find stories. In fact, many, most of the great Bible stories that we, we tell our children and that we study in Sunday school and everything, have angels involved when you stop to think about it. Why would we think it strange that angels are still not involved in the world today? So we really, as Christians, we've had that sort of swing and in interest in angels. We believe in them, but unless we've sort of been in a situation where we've had to experience uh, the angelic world, we really don't uh, really believe it when it comes to truth. Throughout history, as I say, there have been interest in angels, not only in the church, but in, in the world. Uh, the angel, uh, interest in angels has increased on occasion, and it's backed off on occasion. But the uh, interest, if you would study art, and again, I'm not one who would really uh, enjoy studying art. I like a good old picture, but, but I don't like a lot of things that's called art, and have, don't like a lot of things that have been called art through history. But uh, you would find that, that in various stages in history and in the art world, that angels have played a prominent theme in, in artwork and in collector's artwork. The, uh, and, and so it's not uh, uh, unusual to think about angels from a secular point of view. Interest also has been especially shown throughout the ages in the negative side of the study of angels, the study that we would call a, astrology, witchcraft, spiritism, uh, psychic phenomena, and this is on a tremendous uh, uh, increase today. In fact, you can hardly turn on television and watch television without an ad for, for a psychic uh, uh, phone number for you to call, and it only costs you probably $100 a minute after they get you stuck on there or whatever. I don't know what it is. I've never called and don't intend to call, but, but it's, you see it advertised on, on TV. You, you uh, see uh, advertisements, and you have angels, uh, and you go through. It's just angels are everywhere. So I guess I'd like to begin today really by dealing with the reality and existence of angels. I don't think we have to say too much about either one because it's so clearly established both in history and in the Word of God. But let's deal with it very briefly. If you look at your outline when it comes to the reality and existence of angels, the first point we, we make is that the reality and existence of angels was denied by the Sadducees. There are still many people today who deny the reality and existence of angels. Even as the poll said that was taken by Time magazine, the poll said 69% of the people who were polled believed in the reality of angels or believed in angels. So not everybody believes in angels. And yet, by the same token, that is not new. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, just to read this scripture that's given, we are reminded that, uh, that the, the Sadducees... It says, did not believe in angels. So let me turn and read Acts chapter 23, verse 8. Acts 23, verse 8. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And so the Sadducees did not believe in resurrection, and they did not believe in angels or in the spirit world. Maybe that's why they get their name. They were sad, you see. They, they did not believe in resurrection. They did not believe in angels. And so it's really a sad situation. But it does emphasize Pharisees. The Pharisees believed in both resurrection and angels. Again, it would be interesting to take this back to the questions that the Sadducees asked the Lord Jesus Christ at, uh, when they were trying to trick the Lord Jesus Christ and find occasion against him. And when they, they gave the illustration, well, there was this man that had a wife and the wife died, and, and so, or, or, excuse me, there was this wife that had a, a husband and the husband died, and you go through, and it goes through, and, and then the second husband died and the third husband, well, who's going to be, and what was the answer? You do err not knowing the Scriptures. 
And then Jesus again speaks about angels and uh, deals with this. But the Sadducees didn't even believe in resurrection, so why did they ask the question? And they did not believe in angels, so Jesus simply verifies both for them. Jesus said there are angels and there is resurrection. And so he makes that and establishes that point very clearly with them. So as far as the reality and existence of angels, even though it's denied by the Sadducees, it's declared in the scriptures. Now we will deal more with this uh, as we go through, but if you would go through, the Old Testament makes numerous references to angels. Almost every one of the Bible stories that you could tell, and it's interesting, we're doing an introduction in our young people's Bible study, we're doing a, a survey of Old Testament history in preparation for a study of, of the time chart of, of the uh, uh, dispensations from eternity to eternity, and as we've gone through, it's amazing the number of Bible stories, you know, we're section, when we get into a section that's very familiar, the kids can tell you all the Bible stories. But then you get into another section, and I know they're not going to be able to tell the stories. And when I say, uh, I give a clue, uh, they're going to sit there and look with a blank stare because uh, they're not as familiar. They're not stories that we are, are familiar with. But most of the stories that we're familiar with, if you read through, angels are involved. Were angels involved when Abraham offered Isaac? This is yes, this is no. Okay? They were, okay? Were angels involved in the flood? <laughs> That's not a trick question. If you believe that angels are the sons of God, then very definitely this way. If you don't, maybe you'll teeter a little bit on that one. You go through, uh, and story after story after story, were angels involved in giving the law? The scriptures are true. They are five times, four times in the, I said last night, four times, young people. It's five times, four times, in the New Testament, one time in the Old Testament, refers to angels and their relationship and the giving of the law. Okay? You go through and story after story after story. Were angels involved in the Exodus? Mm hmm Okay? Begin to look at every story that you're familiar with. Jacob's Ladder. Okay? Samson. Gideon. Just story after story after story. Angels are there. And we often read the scriptures and we just breeze right over that. Now, I realize a lot of these stories, one that's involved is the angel of the Lord, the angel of Jehovah. And that, I can tell you right now, is a study that you ought to do totally on its own. It's a fascinating study in establishing who the angel of the Lord is, identifying the angel of the Lord. We, uh, and if you look at the notes, you'll find out that we establish his deity and, and his identification unique from the Father and from the Spirit and uh, then how he's manifested. And it's fascinating to consider the angel of the Lord. But the word, the, the idea, is certainly there. We also look at the New Testament. When you look at the New Testament, as far as being declared in the Scriptures, there's no question the reality and existence of angels. How many New Testament events involve angels? When you stop to think about it, <laughs> Probably a whole lot more than you can imagine. Many times in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the early church, how many occasions in the early church were angels involved? Read the book of Acts. And some occasions you read uh, through, and we'll give some, some more information on this a little bit. Angels are all the way through the New Testament. So the scriptures very, de very definitely declare the existence and reality of angels. Numerous references are given in Old Testament, in New Testament, to the existence and reality of angels. It's demonstrated in the world. It's uh, denied by the Sadducees, declared in the Scriptures, demonstrated in the world. Again, it's very interesting if you would read history, the emphasis that you would find in history on angels. Now, I've read just a few stories, but let me give you to you a few stories just to whet your interest a little bit. World War I has many stories involving angels. Now, some of these stories interested me because, as I say, on the way back from, from India, we stopped over in London and we went up to Cambridge, and uh, there is now, just outside of Cambridge, England, there is a, a museum of, of, uh, uh, of warplanes from, from the early wars, and, and especially because of the, the impact that, that uh, the uh, Royal Air Force and the German uh, uh, Air Force had in World War One and in World War Two, but uh, it was fascinating to read and, and to study some of the history and stories behind the stories. 
stories that we don't often hear, but one such story is called The Angels of Mons. And maybe you've heard this story, but the story was told throughout England within a month after the Battle of Mons. And if you, you read the story, you'd find in August of 1914, the British troops were heavily outnumbered, and they had fought for days with no break whatsoever. Their number was beginning to be depleted because of, of loss in the, in the, uh, in the war, uh, guns, ammunition was, was uh, uh, badly de de deflated, and so uh, they were at the point almost of surrender. And a man by the name of Captain Hayward tells the story that suddenly, in the middle of this battle that was going on, suddenly the firing stopped on both sides of the line. To the astonishment of the, Brit the British soldiers saw four or five wonderful beings much bigger than men between them and the Germans. These men were bareheaded, wore white robes, seemed to float rather than walk. Their backs were to the British, and their arms were outstretched to the Germans. At that moment, the horses ridden by the German cavalrymen became terrified, stampeded off in every direction, and says this was witnessed by a large number of people. What were these four great creatures that were seen? Well, most people believe that these were angels that God sent to intervene and to protect the British army at that point in time. Hayward goes ahead and tells another story about the war when matters matter seemed to be hopeless again for the British soldiers. They were surrounded by German soldiers. The enemy suddenly stopped their heavy fire, and things grew strangely quiet. The sky opened with a bright, shining light of figures uh, of luminous beings appeared floating between British and German lines, and the German soldiers who, who, who gave up that day and were captured, when they were asked, why, had, why did you retreat and why did you finally surrender? The British soldiers uh, were, were told, they looked in amazement and said, well, well you were surrounded by host and host of people, or we were surrounded by host and host of your people. And all they could see is a host of people surrounding them. They did not realize that they were on the very edge of victory. Who were these hosts and hosts of people? They were not British soldiers. Who were they? In World War II, similar stories carry on. In September 1940, early a Sunday morning, I realized that Churchill should have been at meeting, but he was not. Uh, war was going on. He and some of his military advisors were in, uh, in an underground operation room in southern England watching the lights on the battle charts. Reports had come in that supplies were dangerously low. German forces were preparing to invade England. Suddenly, the alert sounded that announced the approach of Nazi aircraft from several directions, 40 from one direction, 60 from another direction, followed by a formation of 80 uh, Nazi airplanes, followed by wave after wave of planes. This was only the beginning as planes seemed to come out of everywhere toward southern England. There were only 25 squadrons defending southern England of the Royal Air Force. Soon all of them were in the air. Tension grew in the operations room because they knew defeat was imminent. Then, without explanation, the markers on the chart began to move eastward, and the great Nazi Air Force turned back 185 planes down in flames. The Royal Air Force had won the battle, or had they? Some of the downed Nazi pilots were questioned, and those questioned were all asked the question, or were all asked the question, excuse me, where did you get all of your airplanes? From our reports, you were limited in the number of planes you had to put in the air. And all the Nazis could see were British airplanes. Where did you get all of these planes? Was this God's host again? I'm not here to say yes or no, but I'm here to tell you we need to consider it. Because it's not dissimilar to stories that we have in the Bible. The British as a nation were praying for safety for their country and for their military forces. In fact... In 1940, from 1940 to the end of the Second World War, throughout the Commonwealth, every evening when Big Ben sounded 9 p.m., 
the entire nation observed a moment of prayer. An imprisoned Nazi intelligence officer was asked by his captors, or, or told his captors, excuse me, with the striking of your Big Ben clock each evening, you used a secret weapon which we did not understand. It was very powerful, and we could find no countermeasure against it. <laughs> that interesting. The only secret message that they are a secret weapon they had at 9 p.m., when Big Ben struck 9 p.m., the nation went to prayer for a minute. Nazi intelligence officer said, what was that secret weapon? We could not go against it. Isn't that interesting when you think about it? Other stories have been recorded and could be told. An outstanding story that was told that I really enjoyed had to do with the Vietnam War. And uh, this is a war that uh, I'm much more familiar with. World War I, I wasn't at all familiar with. World War II, the last days of World War II, I was born. That's probably why the war stopped very soon after that, you know. The, <laughs> but uh, the Vietnam War, I was at the age where uh, being a U.S. citizen, uh, I could have been drafted. Uh, I happened to have a 2S and then a 4D classification, and if any of you know, Joe would know what that is and others. Uh, I was given a ministerial deferment, uh, ultimately, and it, had, it got to the case where they had to draft me. I'd have had to have been gone in as an officer in the chaplaincy because of the classification I had. Thankfully, neither of those happened. But when we came to Canada in 1968, everybody thought I was a draft dodger because that's what was happening, and everybody from the States was coming to Canada. And I made it very clear that I was not that. Anyhow, in 1968, an entire village in South Vietnam was said to have experienced angelic protection. There were two young men, Cliff, uh, Cliff Custer and Keith Swaggerly, who were visiting a village there and said there were many Christians in this village. A Viet Cong guerrilla soldier who had been raised in this village slipped into the village and he warned the village that they were about to be attacked by a hundred or by a thousand Viet Cong soldiers. And because he had been raised there, he wanted to warn the people, even though he was one of those Viet Cong soldiers. The villagers had no weapons, they had no ammunition, and they really only had a very few men who were able to fight. And so they knew as a village they could do nothing except pray fervently for God's protection. And so they prayed through the night, they sang songs of praise and thanksgiving. The next morning at dawn, the first shots were fired, and just as suddenly, they stopped. A few, day later, a few days later, Viet Cong soldiers were captured and brought into the village, and they were asked why they stopped firing. And the Viet Cong soldiers who had been captured replied, All of a sudden, there appeared all around the village men clad in shining white. We fired at them, but they wouldn't fall. They shone brighter than the sun, and we couldn't aim at them. We were terrified, and so ran. Is this angelic intervention again? Well, I can't say, but it certainly does match, again, some of the things that we learn in scriptures regarding angels. Many other stories could be told. These are but a handful of stories that you can read in history. These aren't Bible stories. These are stories that have been recorded by secular historians because of the outstanding uh, a change of events that resulted in the only thing that could be described really as angelic intervention. Survey of the interest and in doctrine of angels throughout church history. We'll go through this very quickly. Angels have been, uh, been an interest in the church from its birth. The early church experienced intervention by angels as recorded in the book of Acts. The early church received warnings regarding angels. All right? It's interesting, the early church, uh, uh, they, were, they were warned that there would be false angels who would pretend to be ministers of righteousness. Satan himself was called the angel of light, if you remember. And so the early church was warned against these uh, ministers of righteousness, angel, the angel of light. There were false angels uh, that the church was warned against, that if an angel comes to you and preach any other gospel unto you than that which I preached, okay? And so there was a warning. And how often have you heard people, or at least I have heard people, say, oh, you know, well, well, if, if I just had uh, that message from an angel, I would believe it. Well, I want to tell you, 
Not necessarily. Angels can deliver false messages. In fact, I believe the majority of the angelic activity today, and I would go so far as to say all the angelic activity today as far as delivering messages are false messages because we believe revelation has ceased. And we don't need angelic messages. We need obedience to the Word of God. And this is what we need to be aware of because the messages are coming through loud and clear, but they are false messages. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Paul warned in the book of Colossians about worshiping angels. The church is told uh, on several occasions that we're to resist the devil, we're to flee from him. And, and uh, so there are many warnings that are given in the scriptures concerning angels. One of the earliest church councils, if you read again in church history, 325 A.D., the Council of Nicaea, made a statement regarding angels and made angels or the study of angels part of orthodox theology. Not that it was not before because it was in God's word, but it became an official part of orthodox theology as far as a statement of belief at the Council of Nicaea. Twenty years later, actually 18 years later, uh, the, another church council met, and this church council had to make another statement. But the statement that they had to make in 343 A.D. was, angels are not to be worshipped. They forbid the worship of angels, and they called the worship of angels idolatry. And so very early in church history, once the church established, yes, angels are real, and we need to acknowledge angels, and we need to realize angels are intervening in our behalf and so on, then the church has to come out with another statement and say, but don't worship them because the natural tendency of man. And let me tell you, that's what's happening in the world today. People are worshiping angels. We're not worshiping the God of the Bible. People today are worshiping angels. And there's a warning, very clear warning against that. In fact, if you read in the scriptures, angels themselves give that warning. Angels, when uh, John fell down to worship in the book of Revelation, the angel said, don't worship me, worship God. And we need to realize that, and we need to understand uh, how important worship is, but not the worship of angels. About 500 A.D. until 1347, angels became a great part of the Roman Catholic doctrine and dogma. And worship, uh, 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 be, uh, a, the angel be, uh, worship became a vital part of the Roman Catholic Church as well. And we, you don't uh, uh, hear that very often if you're talking to people because they don't like to acknowledge that. But they still, and if you read, do they not, uh, in a sense, in their, their uh, veneration of saints, they actually are making those saints objects of worship and angelic beings. If you talk to them and find out, they really declare them to be angels. The, uh, when it came to the days of Martin Luther, you find that uh, during the Reformation, the focus on angels subsided and focus became uh, totally different in the Reformation days. During the 17 and 1800s, the Western Church again became interested in angels. And this is seen through the influence of art, uh, poetry. But if you go and, and you see some of the great chapels that were built during this time, the great churches, the great stained glass windows, and as I say, I was in... Uh, uh, when I was in London and Cambridge area, I was in some of the churches that have the stained glass windows that go back to the 1500s and to the uh, 1600s and 1700s. And you look and, and uh, the, the art that's there, angels are very prominent. But again, wrong concept concerning angels. In the 1800s, late 1800s, the early 1900s, because of the great missionary movement, there was a renewed interest in angels. That interest in angels waned a little bit for a while, waned a little bit for a while, but has been increasing in the last few years, partly because of an author by the name of Frank Peretti, if you know him, partly because of people who are writing books now, uh, Bondage Breaker and so on, Neil Anderson and some of these guys, and I'll be glad to talk to you one-on-one -on -one about some of these authors if you're interested. I have my opinion on, on some of these things and what they've written and, and so on, but uh, it's not uh, for me to, to deal with right now. Some of the missionary stories. Let me give to you as we bring this session to a close very quickly. A couple of missionary stories that I think are fascinating regarding uh, the, the intervention of angels in behalf of missionaries. John Patton, and some of you have read perhaps his biography and, and uh, information about John Patton. John Patton uh, talks about uh, he and his 
uh, family were uh, surrounded by hostile natives as they were in their missionary headquarters. And these hostile, missionary, uh, these hostile natives had the intent of burning the patents out and then killing them one by one. They, uh, uh, when daylight came, the patents were amazed to see that the attackers had unaccountably taken leave. They were nowhere to be found. They simply thanked God for delivering them. They had prayed for protection or for the will of God to be done in their lives. When the next morning, when the, the uh, captors were, were gone, they thanked God for delivering them. A year later, a year later, the chief of the tribe that had surrounded them for the purpose of killing them was marvelously saved. He came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And the chief, when he came to Patton to tell of his faith in Christ, the chief Ask, uh, was asked by John Patton, why did you leave? Why did you not burn us out and kill us as you planned? And the chief replied in a surprised voice, who were those men you had there? John said there was no one here but he and his wife, their family. The chief argued that they had seen many men standing guard, hundreds of big men in shining garments with drawn swords in hand. They seemed to encircle the mission station, and my warriors were afraid to attack. I tell you, read these stories. It's a, uh, it really causes you to begin to see the protective power of God for his people. I really enjoy this story because I love the involvement of angels in answering prayer. And I will close with this story. This is a true story that was reported by the Overseas Missionary Fellowship. And it's a story that uh, a missionary who came home on furlough was giving a report to his home church. And let me just read, read uh, this story to you. It says, while serving at a small mission hospital, this is a report that the missionary gave to his home church. While serving in a small mission, a small field hospital in Africa, I traveled every two weeks to the jungle to a nearby city for supplies. This requires camping overnight halfway. On one of these trips, I saw two men fighting in the city. One was seriously hurt, so I treated him and witnessed to him about the Lord Jesus Christ. I then returned home without incident. Upon arriving back in the city again several weeks later, I was approached by the man I had treated earlier. He told me he had known that I, had, that I carried money and medicine. He said, some friends and I followed you into the jungle knowing you would camp overnight. We waited for you to go, as go asleep and plan to kill you and take the money and drugs. Just as we were about to move into your campsite, we saw that you were surrounded by 26 armed guards. I laughed at this and said, I was certainly all alone out in the jungle campsite. The young man pressed the point. No, sir, I was not the only one to see the guards. My five friends also saw them, and we all counted them. It was because of those guards that we were afraid and left you alone. At this point in his presentation in the local church, and this, by the way, took place down in Michigan, one of the men in the church stood up and interrupted the missionary, and he asked, Can you tell me the exact date when this happened? The missionary thought for a while and recalled the date. The man in the congregation then gave his side of the story. He stated, On that night in Africa, it was day here. I was preparing to play golf. Probably in the Grand Rapids area, don't you think so? Don't you guys all play golf down there? I was preparing to play golf. As I put my bag in the car, I felt the Lord calling me to pray for you. In fact, the urging was so great that I called men of the church together to pray for you. Will all of those men who met to pray with me, please stand. The men that had met and prayed together that day stood. There were 26 of them. Isn't that amazing? Does God use his angels in answer to prayer? Well, our time is past. I will stop there. We'll pick up with this in just a few minutes, and we'll get away from the stories and get into the work now. Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that angels are real. Angels do exist. 
Angels are involved, involved in the affairs of men. And Father, we thank you that you have given good angels, holy angels, to care for the saints. And we do not have to be afraid of the evil angels. Father, I pray that you would give to us today just a desire to love you and to serve you more because we realize your great love and care for us as we see your ministering spirits in light of the word. We thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to take a 15-minute break, and uh, please use the washrooms and look at the book table. Help yourself to some of the free literature that's back there, and we'll look forward to our second session. Thank you, Jack. Thank you.